So this is a really exciting live. It's gonna be focused on tea pottery here on the West. Now, of course, it'll just be one very unique perspective that I think can bring a lot of value to this topic. Um, and there'll be an artist and potter known as Arturo Alrez, um, which I first met about three and a half years ago um, in Seattle. We had some tea and he gifted me one of his teapots. Um, at first it wasn't much, but it could pour quite well. Um, and it was quite shocking. And he said that he had expressed an interest in learning and making teapots. And I said, well, that would be very interesting. He always had a lot of good skill, but then I didn't hear much from him for about uh, two years or so. And then I saw I'd seen his teapots pop up on Instagram and social media. And now we're here are today with one of his more newer creations. And it's quite shocking how far he's come. And I think he can, he can add and share a very, very unique perspective um, to making teapots here in the West. Some of the advantages, disadvantages, um, and share some of his story. He also was featured in a Japanese reality TV show um, where he was fortunate enough to go to Japan um, and meet a Japanese teapot master um, and spend some time with him and study. We'll get right into it. I was just doing a short introduction, kind of how I first met you. Uh, I think that's three and a half years ago, or three years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. It was just funny because you walked in, we had some tea. I don't think I had much contact with you before. You didn't say much. And then you like pulled a little teapot out of your pocket. And you're like, I've been making uh, teapots. <laughs> and I was like, wow, it functions quite well. And you said, this is what I wanted to do. And now we're here um, three years later. And it's just amazing um, what you're able to produce. So I'm really excited to kind of talk more and have you share um, some of your story. But maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what kind of inspired you three years ago to get into making teapots. So three years ago, I actually, I was visiting a friend uh, here in Olympia during the winter. And at the time she was actually uh, living in one of the homes. If you're familiar with tiny homes, they're just, you know, these really small houses that are it's just kind of off so to speak. And I was hanging out with her at, at her in her little tiny home and I remember asking her, I was like, Hey, do you have any tea? And she was like, Yeah, I have some tea and then so she goes to the you know, the corner, this little corner where she has like a desk and stuff and she pulls out a little basket and and I'm looking and I'm, you know, expecting her to pull out some tea bags and stuff and then she just like pulls out a bag of loose leaf tea. And so she hands me the tea and she's like, look. And and I remember asking her, I was just like, wow, this smells really good. But I was like, uh, but where's the tea bags? <laughs> so I remember asking her, I was like, are you going to put this in a tea bag and then put it in a cup or something? And and she starts laughing and she's like, no. And she's like, this is how we're going to make it. And then she pulls out a small little yixing pot and I started cracking up because I, I thought she was just like showing me a toy and I remember asking her I was like what is that little small toy and and she's like just watch and so then she pulls out a little a little tray and you know she she does a, a gong fu ceremony so she puts the tea in there and you know there's she heats up the pot with water and all of this stuff and and I remember right there, uh, you know, after, as she's serving me this tea, Gong Fu style, I, I just was really captivated by, by the whole ceremony. And, and I'm drinking the tea and, you know, it tasted really amazing. And actually, I remember telling you this story when I was visiting you at your studio. I remember telling you that it was actually um, one of the sticky rice tau chas. So it was, you know, a ripe puer. Yeah. And, and I remember you saying like, oh, no, he's like, that, that's not very good. <laughs> and but anyways, like what, what was funny is that while I was experiencing the ceremony with her, I just kept thinking, oh, look, it's it's uh, my friend uh, Shiloh. Oh, yeah, he's turning in. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I remember thinking while I was watching her serve this tea, gosh, you know, I really want to make a teapot that I can use, you know, and 
and that's kind of how it all started. I just had this idea. I was like, oh, I want to make a teapot for myself so that I can use it every day and, and implement this, this new practice, you know, this tea ceremony into my morning meditations. And that's how it all started. And, and did so, you have any previous experience in pottery or clay work? Oh, uh, yeah, I took a class years ago. Um, gosh, actually, I was I was looking um, just out of curiosity. I was looking through my Facebook because, you know, on Facebook, you can store albums of pictures and stuff. And I had a few pictures of uh, when I was in college, California. And I had pictures of some of the pottery that I did. And that was actually over 10 years ago. So I took, I did take a pottery class about 10 years ago. Um, so I guess, yeah, I had some experience, but you know, it was, it's not like, it's not like riding a bicycle, Jeffrey, you know, it's like you, you ride a bike and you never forget. I remember when I, when I started doing the pottery again, it was horrible. Like I couldn't even center the clay and yeah, it, it, it took some time before I, finally was able to make a teapot that worked <laughs> but uh, the stuff that I was the stuff that I brought to your studio I think I had already been making teapots for like two years that, that might have been like the second year um, oh, wow. but I remember the, the first year it was it was more I guess my practice the first year was more spaced out mm -hmm. because I didn't have my own equipment or my own studio and stuff and so I would make it to the the Evergreen College pottery studio from time to time. I see. Because I remember yeah. when you first got that teapot, I was just kind of shocked. I'm like, you just made this? And it was able to function and work. And then at, from that point, after kind of achieving making a teapot for yourself, what kind of clicked in your brain that you were like, I want to take this to the next level. I want to keep trying to perfect the teapot. Well, I just really fell in love with the process, Jeffrey, because it was very challenging. You know, like, and I know that sounds kind of confusing, but in regards to art, any type of art, you know, it, it always came natural to me. It's, some, it's something that I've done my whole life, and uh, I very rarely have experienced um, that type of challenge, meaning like, you know, when I was taking painting classes or sculpting classes, like all these classes, it all felt very easy for me. Even when I took the pottery class, it was easy. But then again, I wasn't really interested in pottery. When I took that class, I just remember thinking, man, I'm probably never going to do anything with this. I wasn't really interested in it. And so, you know, years later, when I decided to make a teapot, it, I, it was so challenging, Jeffrey, that I almost like took it personal. I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, i I'm going to get so good at this because I'm having such a hard time with it. And, and I just kind of stuck to it. I mean, that was really the, the main motivator. I just, it was so challenging that I wanted to get really good at it. And so now, you know, here we are and it's like taking me on this like amazing journey. So uh, now I'm, you know, really just in love with, with it in, in so many different ways, not just making teapots, but, you know, tea and tea history, tea culture, tea community. Um, it's, it's amazing, you know, how, how it led to this bigger thing. And how do you feel this kind of journey, not only from the tea perspective of making tea and the community you learned about with the tea drinkers, but also the pottery community, what do you think some of the advantages and disadvantages potters have when trying to make teaware, especially for something that's for loose leaf tea that has a lot of Eastern influence, um, but as a potter making teaware here in the West, what do you think are some of the advantages and disadvantages? And of course, that might be different from individual to individual. Yeah, so advantages and disadvantages. I would say um, one of the advantages is that, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to get started, I would say, because there's a studio in most places. Um, and then also, the the materials and stuff are, are pretty um, low cost and easy to access. Uh, the I, the disadvantage is, is definitely that uh, it's it's tricky, you know, to like make make a teapot. 
that that can actually well a good teapot for loosely because now that I've learned so much about um, loose tea and making teapots and just pottery in general or teaware loose leaf tea uh, it's it's much more complicated it's not as easy as just like in some clay and making some cups or a teapot because there's so many there's i mean you would know this have that pink kettle there and you know that pink kettle compared to uh, you know a, a, a different inexpensive kettle functions just just as well um, will actually change the quality of the tea uh, because of the metals or the metal used for kettles so it's the same thing with clay you know it's it's going to alter the tea in one way or another and, and also just from a functional you know perspective where is a pretty delicate thing because mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of factors that you have to take take in like a cup for example what kind of cup do you want to make you know like the shape of the cup is is like something to think about the size of the cup you know the thickness of the cup the the glaze that you use um the type of clay that you use and you know there's like so many factors that go into this and it's just a cup you know <laughs> it's just a cup so when you start talking about teapots it's the same thing there's m much more to take in because uh, it's just like the the functional complexities of a teapot. From like the beginning when you started to now, how does that affect how you choose your raw material of clay? As you're saying, it can affect the taste or even affect the firing process. And how do you choose your clays? I think initially I was more attracted to the way it looked because I hadn't really developed the ability to uh, pick or or experience the the smaller the, the smaller things with tea. I think that as as you continue to drink more and more tea, you have the ability to, or you develop the ability, or your senses kind of improve, so you can taste more, you can smell more. And so now, when I'm picking my clay, I think I'm more interested in like clays that are going to improve the qualities of the tea. Then, then you have to start getting specific because you know you have different types of tea. So the the clay that that I work with mostly it has a lot of minerals in it. So it's it's really good for oolongs, for pu'ers or ripe pu'ers, um, red tea. Um, it would do well with some green teas also, but from my own experience, I think that, um, you know, like fine stoneware or porcelain uh, is really well, or goes, it works really well with, with more delicate teas or more floral teas. Selecting the right clays that are going to improve the quality of the teas is a little more important than the actual um, texture or the way that, that the, the end the end teapot is going to look. But if, when you get both of them right, it, it looks really beautiful and it enhances the qualities of the tea, then, you know, I, then I work with, I like to work with that type of clay a lot. But sure. it's, uh, it, I don't know, as, as an artist, it's, there's this thing that um, all artists would relate to, I'm sure. It's, it, there's just like this need to, to be exploring and trying different things because otherwise it just gets boring, you know? And so we don't and want art to be boring. And the clay you use it now that you say recently you're using more of, is that a local clay? Is that a clay that you bring in? Oh, it's actually a local clay. So I get most of my clay from one of the clay stores uh, here in Tacoma. Um, but one of the things that I'm going to be focusing on this year is um, and more, I'm going to be studying how to make my own clays um, because there there are some potters that make teaware, on, you know, on the Instagram, on our Instagram community that uh, that do that. Meaning they, I'm sure many of the people watching this know of uh, Petr Novak, and you know he's been making teapots for like or teaware for like 20 years, and he he's good at making his own clay. And so he's not the only uh, potter that that knows how to do this. And so 
the information is out there. I just have to, you know, sit down and read a couple of books <laughs> and sure. exploring it because it's, it, it just adds a little more control, I would say, because right now I'm, I'm limited to what's available. And what's the no thing is like, I've noticed like with this particular teapot, how much like structural and functional thought went into this teapot. The lid is deeper, right? So I can pour this very calmly, right? I don't have to worry about this lid flying off and breaking. Yeah. Um, it doesn't dripping when I finish the pour, all these finite details. Um, and what do you think now is the hardest part of making teapots versus, you know, three years ago when you were starting, what was the hardest part then? The hardest part of making a teapot. Um, I would say that, well, there, there's three things, three things that are still probably like the most challenging. That is uh, making the teapot really, really light. I'm not going to remove clay from my tool, make the teapot lighter. I'm going to actually shape it really, really light. And so there's no trimming involved or really, really thin. Um, and then the second thing is making the lids that are really, really tight. Because even though it's, you would think that it's easy. Oh, you just measure the size of the lid and the size of the teapot, you know, opening. Um, it's, it's much more complicated because they're different sizes. So when you're making them, that means that they're going to dry at different, different rates. You have to wait until both the lid and the teapot are the same consistency. Like they've both dried out to the same amount. So then you can begin to actually work the lid and the teapot and, and get it to, to fit right. But then the other thing is that sometimes when you fire it, stuff shrinks and stuff warps. And so there's a lot of, a lot of factors that go into it. And the last thing is actually making the spouts because there's, there's a lot of different ways to make a spout, but you have to think about how you, how you want your teapots at pour because long food pots they don't most of them don't really care about that little drill right so there's like you you can use a gung food pot and then pour there's always like a dribbling you know like a bead of water that kind of runs on the spout and in chinese culture that's not a big deal because it's that's what the ceremony is right like in gung fu there's just like water everywhere water splashing Japanese do not like that, that dribbling. And so learning how to make a spout that doesn't dribble was tricky. Um, although if you, if anybody that spends a little time researching this, like, yeah, so there's a good spot. I'm gonna do an example here. What he means by that dribble, which is often far too common um, with some of these teapots is uh, sometimes you'll see this dribble come down this one actually pours decently well, but when you go slower, you see that like that. But there was, of course, master craftsmen that avoided that in China. After the Chinese Revolution, they started to do more of a utilitarian teapot. They just cared about the quality of the clay, and they just pumped these teapots out. Um, this is a very classic design, but it does have a lot of maybe not so pristine functional use. Where if you get something, I'll even demonstrate with one of your pots, um, which was kind of shocking to me. I don't really want to waste this tea, so I'll put the cup under it. Um, but you can pour slower or faster, and you're not going to get that dribble. But it cuts off much better, which is really nice. Yeah. So that's a tricky thing because if you start researching, you know, the different spouts, there's, there's one design that will prevent any type of dribbling. There, there's a, a curve to the spout. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna draw this spout. I'm gonna draw the spout that I'm talking about because if I try to describe it, I, I feel like I might lose a couple people. So there's, this is the type of spout that that you would see that often prevents dribbling pretty well. It, it kind of does this. There's like a curve that goes down like that. Mm. Like that, right? So the interesting thing about this type of spout is that when when you start pouring, the stream is not 
consistent and the water doesn't just like flow the way it does with the spout that you have there it it's kind of like is is sporadic so you have to kind of pour slowly with with this type of spout and so i made a couple like this and i didn't like it you know i just didn't like the fact that i had to pour slowly and I couldn't actually let the, the stream of water just shoot out of the, the pot, which I've always really liked. <laughs> and uh, I remember that that was one of the things that, that kind of startled you when you used that teapot when I, that I brought to your studio. You were like, let's test the pour. And then it, it functioned really well. And I remember you were like, whoa, <laughs> because it, it had like a stream that could shoot out of the pot. <laughs> and so it's the interesting thing about it then is that you know when you start making spouts with these type of spouts you have a lot of different options but you also have to think about how you know the experience that people are going to have you know do you want them to have a pot that can pour out at at different rates and not get all not, you know not have a stream of water all messy or do you want to make a, a pot that pours slower but doesn't have any dribbling? So it's, I decided that I don't really like those other spouts. Um, not to say <laughs> that I don't make them. I, I do. But uh, the spout that, that you have on that pot, that's, that's kind of the spout that, uh, that I'm attracted to because it's basically just a clean cut. The trick to those spouts is that you have to make them really thin. So the thinner, the better, because then the stream of water gets cut off easier. But then it's also the cut. So there's an angle to the cut. Yeah, so the, the angle has to kind of go like this. Yeah, it's if not you, perfectly flat. It's like a... Yeah, now if you go perfectly flat, then it doesn't function as well. Those are the three things, not, not to like keep going on a rant. You know, the spout, the lid, and then the, the, the thickness of the, the clay body. Well, there is one, then there's one additional thing, which I noticed you perfected maybe more recently, is the filter inside the pot. Because oh, yeah. just like this pot, maybe if you pour it correctly, it's not so bad. But a lot of it has to do with this, all this has is a little hole. So if you're depending on the type of tea you're brewing, if that hole gets clogged, then you have a serious problem and you're gonna overbrew your tea, it won't pour out. But you have almost like this, this almost silicone, like this kind of ball lid. Um, inside of this that I've noticed I haven't had any clogging problems no matter what kind of tea. I've been brewing ripe tea, raw pour, aged pour, condensed tea, loose tea, and it has never clogged the spout. Um, so maybe you can talk a little more about your uh, filters. Okay. Yeah, so actually I didn't really think about that, but it's true. That's also a, a huge factor in all of this because before I learned how to make these spouts, um, I was still, I still had like a similar shape, meaning like the inside of the pot still had like this little basket and then I would punch the holes out. But in order to, to have like a really, really small spout, um, you're kind of limited to the amount of holes that you can make if you're using that technique where you're just kind of uh, indenting the, the clay wall. So yeah. Learning how to make that type of strainer, actually, um, it was, I had to go to Japan to learn how to make that type of strainer. <laughs> so, and it's actually something that I, wa I, you know, I wanted to make because when I was learning how to make teapots and I got really into it and, you know, now I'm focusing on, on more technical functional stuff. I remember thinking, man, like, I know for a fact that these like Japanese style strainers are just like the best because I actually, I owned a pot. I bought it at like an antique store and it was like a top handle pot. It was like this beautiful porcelain, just simple pot, but it, it had that type of strainer. And I remember that it functioned really well with any type of tea. And the problem that I was having with, with my previous work that, you know, I, I basically would just kind of indent the clay wall and, and punch out holes. Um, the the size of the holes were too big. And if I made them too small, um, I, I still wasn't able to get the the same, you know, functional effect that this one has. Meaning like 
there was a lot of flaws with this other approach. And so I went online and I was trying to figure out how to make these strainers and I just never came across anything like no, no videos that showed you, you know, step by step to make these strainers. And so eventually I just gave up. I was like, well, I guess I'm not going to be able to access this online, but Actually, what ended up happening is that this Japanese TV show, it's a, a reality TV show, they contacted me on Instagram and asked me if I wanted to, like, be a part of this program. And, and I was just like, what is this program all about? And no, basically, they said, oh, I'm so confused how all this happened. You know, when I tell this story to people, they're, they're, everyone's just kind of like, what? Like, that's just, how, that's incredible. And... <laughs> And even I was skeptical about it when they contacted me because they contacted me and they they were like, so let me tell you about this TV show. They said, you could qualify for a free trip to Japan, a one week trip to Japan. And then we would curate a trip, this trip, you know, in the thing that you're interested in about Japanese culture. And so basically what that meant for me is that they would plan a trip that revolved around tea or, or tea wear. And so that, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm interested. And they said, but the catch is that you, you only qualify if you've never been to Japan. And I said, great, I've never been to Japan. So I qualified. <laughs> and so they, they sent me a bunch of questions and then I answered all of the questions and, and then, you know, they asked me to make a video. And so I made a short video and and then I, I didn't hear back from them for like months. And, you know, I kept emailing the person that I was in contact with and I didn't hear from them. And so I just was like, well, I guess I didn't, I don't, you know, I'm not going to make it to the finals or whatever. So I just forgot about it. And I, you know, I kept, kept working on making teapots. And then one year later, I'm contacted again. One year from the entry. Yes. One year later, they contact me and then they're asking me, hey, have you heard of this TV show? And then I said, wait a minute, this sounds very familiar. Um, is this the TV show where, you know, you went a trip to Japan and this and this? And they're like, yeah, how did you hear about us? And I said, well, somebody contacted me like a year ago about this. And then they said, really? Well, this is confusing because we don't have any anything, any record of this. And so at that point, I was a little skeptical. I said, well, this is starting to kind of feel like a scam or something. Like, I wonder what they're going to ask for next. And then they basically said, well, what was the name of the person that you were working with? And so I go, I go through my emails and I tell them, oh, th actually, this is her name. And they said, oh, wow, this person doesn't work for us anymore. But I think she got fired like or quit, you know, a few, maybe like a few months after she was, you know, she initiated that, that process with me. And so they said, well, are you still interested? Would you like to, you know, see if you qualify? I said, sure. So I, I went through the same process. I answered a bunch of questions. I sent them a video. and But this time, they were actually keeping in contact with me. So every every month or so, they would send a follow-up email. And then I think the longest I went without hearing from them was maybe like three months. So there's like a three-month period. I didn't hear from them. And then they contacted me, and they said, hey, we have some really great news. They said, the director is actually really interested in working with you. And so you're, you're still qualified for this trip to Japan. And they said, now we're going to send over a, a film crew for, you know, the next part of the process. And basically what they did is they spent like two days interviewing me, asking me a bunch of questions and then taking videos of, of me working and two months went by and they contacted me again and they said, hey, we want to come back out and do another short recording. We need a little more footage. And then at that point, um, I actually, they tricked me. So they came out with, with the ticket and they're like, you want the trip to Japan and, and all that stuff. And so then they were asking me a bunch of questions and they were trying to figure out what I was interested in. Meaning like, do you want to explore, you know, more of the tea side or, or, teapots and so I said I really want to learn how to make teapots from a from a master right because I know that there's like teapot masters in Japan that that's all they do that they just make teapots and and so then I also said but I'm also really interested in in just like the the craftsmanship you know like 
the craftsmen of Japan. And so having said that, they basically planned a trip where I would meet a, a tokoname master. His, his first name is uh, Morokashi Fugetsu. And he actually apprenticed with uh, one of Japan's national treasures, uh, Yamada Josan. Wow. And yeah, so it was kind of a big deal. I didn't really know that I was going to, you know, have access to, to learn from someone like that. But the other thing that they planned was that I was going to actually learn uh, how the Tetsubins are made. When I got to Japan, the first thing that they did was they took me to Iwachu. It's like this, I don't know if you've heard of Iwachu, but it's like this huge uh, uh, steel casting company. And all they, they, all they work with is like cast iron. So they make skillets and anything that you can think of. But they also make Tetsubins um, using traditional techniques because there's actually more advanced uh, ways to cast a Tetsubin now. And so they're, they can be machine produced, in other words. And he was still making them the traditional way. So he was like making the mold from scratch with like river sand and and then, you know, they're melting down the metal and they pour the metal and it was incredible. Like the whole process was really cool. And you can see most of it on the video. Um, but what I found really interesting about the, the Tetsuban is, is that um, there's different processes. So like after they cast it, they still have to like clean it and cut out the hole and like uh, do some assembling. You know, they have to put like the top handle on and then, and then they anneal it. So when, when they anneal it, basically they're just like heating the pot to a certain temperature, basically to the point where metal starts to get kind of cherry red. And, and that is actually um, what makes the, the water taste so like, smooth and, and sweet. It, they, they just anneal it. Um, and he was explaining too, which I'm sure you already know this, like some Tetsubins have like a, a what is it? It's, they're sealed on the inside with some type of enamel. Oh, yeah. Meaning you, you, the water is not actually making contact with the metal. And most people that own Tetsubins have a, a Tetsubin like that. The inside is like enameled. And so that's, that doesn't really do anything to the water. You know, it's not improving the quality of the water because it's like putting water in glass, basically. Because it, so the other cool thing about the Tetsubins is that um, the one that he gave me, which was really amazing, like he gave me the Tetsubin that he was making. And I wasn't expecting that because, you know, that's like an $800 Tetsubin. Some of them were like $1,500, $2,000 because he has different designs. And I was actually going to buy one when I was there because because I had learned so much about the Tetsubins and how, how they can really, you know, improve the the quality of the water and, and also the tea that you're drinking. So when he gave I'll, I'll, I'll budge in here real quick. You note about the Tetsuban is so unique, um, especially when I was learning the last two years with Pour. Uh, Tetsuban that is not enameled, this kind of enameled Tetsuban is very common, nothing good or bad. And they've tried to make those things in almost teapots, like people are brewing tea in those. But traditionally, Tetsubans were just used to boil water. Because um, after you boil uh, enough, maybe spring water or natural spring water, what will happen is there'll be this coating that will develop on the tetsuban. And one thing I noticed when I was at Denong is there was this pure white coating from a tetsuban that was very, very old that would also slowly enhance. So not only is the raw material of the tetsuban influencing the taste of the water, which cannot be to everyone's liking. Sometimes it can be a little bit more iron or metallic, but work fantastic for aged poor or ripe pour um, if you have a Tetsubin available, um, but it does change the flavor a lot. And so you just have to experiment and change. Um, but it's something people should kind of learn more about, think about, because it can have a huge impact on the taste profile of the tea. But yeah, go ahead and continue. Yeah. Um, well, actually the type of metal that is used also plays a huge part. So yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting. And I think the, the one thing that that kind of surprised me is is the way that they finished the exterior surface of this Tetsubin because 
he essentially was using like grass, like a bunch of grass. He made like a brush with grass and the grass is still like green. So it was type, some type of swamp grass, if I recall correctly. And then he's dipping it in this like container full of what looked like black tar. Like literally, like if, if, if you looked at this container, which is like this thick black paste, right? And I remember asking him, I was like, what is that? And because it looks like tar. So I was thinking, is he putting tar on the outside of this? And actually what, what, what it was, it was just like a really, really concentrated like paste that was made out of sencha. So they, they boiled sencha to the point where it was like this thick black, almost like paste. And then they would dip the grass into this paste and then brush it on the outside of the tetsuban while it's really, really hot. So it's basically just like steaming the whole time. And that's how, the, that's how they finished the surface. And it produced this, this beautiful look where it, the metal looks aged and it's like matte. And that's just one of the methods. Uh, he had another method that, that can produce a more rusted look, but uh, it, I think it was like a different type of paste that they made. So that was really cool to me because I, I was always under the impression that, you know, like these Tetsubins, like if you find a beautiful Tetsubin, that it was just like the shiny metal that was just aged and just got rusted naturally. But it's not. It's, a, it's an actual technique that, that they, wow. they use. Yeah, that was really cool. And I don't know if that's, that made it into the video or not. I don't think it did. There's a lot of stuff that they edited out because these are like little secrets that they don't want everyone to have. So it's that's so yeah. interesting because when I was studying with my tea master, she would buy all these um, antique tetsubins that were ridiculously expensive and they would be, some of them would be rusted. And what she did to take the rust out, which was the most absurd thing I ever did, she took like, um, not the most expensive, but a more affordable right pour, like a whole brick, and threw it in there and just boiled water. I'm like, that's so much tea. And she would put yeah. lemon and right pour and just boiled the heck out of it till it was like a sludge. And she did that for yeah. like two days. And then she cleaned it out and then she just boiled water in it for a week. And then the and scrubbed it slightly with a natural sponge, and then most of the rust went away. So there's something yeah, interesting. That's about actually tea. <laughs> they do the same thing because I asked them that question. They said, you know, at some point some rust is going to develop on the inside, right? And he said, but you don't want to scrub that off. Like that's actually pretty good. But when it when it ends up being too much, then you have to clean it. And I said, well, how do you clean it? And then he says. You just put sencha in there and then you boil it like <laughs> on very, you do like a, a very slow boil, not to the point where it's like bubbling and stuff. You just yeah. like kind of have it boiling. Uh, and then you do that for a couple of days until like how you said the the tea kind of turns into like this thicker paste, so to speak. It's just like, it just, it's starting to, it starts to look kind of gummy or something. Mm -hmm. And and then that, what that does is it's actually cleaning some of the rust off. And so I was also pretty surprised with that because I thought, oh, you know, I've looked, I've seen videos on how rust is cleaned and most people use like salt water. They just like boil salt water and then they like scrub it. Um, but apparently you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so yep. it's, a good thing. it's a good thing that I asked those questions. Otherwise, I would I be using salt water. <laughs> so you went to go see the Tetsuban uh, master first and then you saw the teapot master? Yeah, so after... After my trip to Iwachu, um, I ended up going to Tokoname to to learn how a, a, a Tokoname teapot is made from Master Fugetsu. And it was incredible, Jeffrey. I mean, like, I just remember showing up and they actually made fun of me in the video. <laughs> I don't know if you like saw that, but I was really nervous <laughs> because I was like, geez, like I, I, I just, I was very nervous and I don't know why I was so nervous, but I was just like trying to remain calm and stuff. And they were making fun of me. They were like, you're looking very <laughs> stiff. <laughs> why are you so nervous? It's like, relax. And so actually Master Fugetsu ended up being a really, really, like a friendly person and 
he was he was very very friendly and very sick. Like he wanted to, to answer all of my questions, and I had a lot of questions. And so when we were making when he was making his teapots, you know, I, I was just amazed. Like he he did it in like five minutes, like made you know like on the pottery wheel he made just like a perfect flawless really thin teapot in five minutes and at the time when when i visited him it was taking me like half an hour to do what he did in five minutes yeah and and it's mostly just because of the technique like i was just not using the right technique and so when when i got on the pottery wheel he was watching me he was instructing me and he he was like you have to learn how to use one hand and he's like he, like this and i remember thinking like how how did he do that because essentially and this is the reason why he was able to do it so fast because after he showed me this technique i came back here to America and I started practicing and at first it was really really difficult but then once I got a good handle on it I was able to make them faster so now I can actually do them you know in like 15 minutes or something like that I'm not as fast as master forgets it. I can't do it in five minutes yet but I imagine I will at some point if I keep practicing you know so you know that was one of the cool things and I also learned which was thing that I was most interested at the time. I was just like, how do you make these strainers? You know, like that strainer that you see on the inside of teapot, I remember like, how do you make it? And the process wasn't as complicated as I thought because, you know, I thought it required like special tools and stuff. And to a degree, like the, the tool, the tools that he gifted me, because the, the company that was making them just doesn't make them anymore. So there, it is something that, that, the tool that I use anyways, it's not something that you can find anywhere, but you can make a tool that functions very similar because essentially all it is, is just like a little funnel. So even just like the tip of a pen, right? Like if you look at the tip of a pen, it, it, all it is, is just like a little funnel. It's like a cone. Um, and the other thing that you use is like a, actually just like a wooden tool basically half a sphere. so you have like a tool that's like half a sphere and then they put the clay over it and they kind of like push it down and then they punch they puncture the holes out and then and then they attach that on the inside of the pot so learning how to make that was like probably one of the cool the coolest things i would say because this is something that i've had been wanting to learn how to make for years i was just like how do you make these strainers and and now i actually i'm going to be making like uh instructional videos and sharing it with everyone but uh it's taken me some time you know i'm still setting up my studio even though i've already been like producing teapots and stuff i'm my studio is still like slowly being organized because i just I had just, I've only been at this place for like two months now. Oh, so wow. it, it, takes, I don't, it takes some time to put this stuff together. Um, and then there's that. The other thing but, I noticed is that you actually make your, not that specific tool, but you have other tools for measuring your teapots and you make them yourself out of wood. Can you explain what those are for and how you use them? Yeah, so there's different types of tools that you can make. And the tool that you're talking about is... Uh, Typically, they use those for like bowls or cups or something like that because you can measure the depth and then also the width. And those type of tools are designed so that you can have a, a more consistent shape or so that you can repeat a more consistent shape because it's very easy to just like make a cup, right? But when you start trying to make them the same size, you need specific tools. And that's one of the tools that that potters use. It's a, a just a regular wooden tool. I mean, you can make them literally out of twigs, out of any type of wood. <laughs> All you need is one that kind of goes into the the cup, and then one that has one that goes across 
um, the opening of the cup so that you have the depth and then also the the width of the cup. Um, and you can use those for lids also, but the ones that I use for lids are, it, it just basically looks like a little, like a prong like that. So I just use it to measure the, the opening. Yeah. And there's different types of tools, but um, you know, the ones that I was using prior were just like these, they, they basically look like scissors. They look like that. So you can open them up like this, but they're really big. They're like, you know, they're big. And I don't need something that big. Um, it might come in handy for bigger projects, but it, it kind of complicated things. And I didn't realize until I made my own tools how much easier it is to have a smaller tool that can do the measuring. So I, lear I actually learned that from Fugetsu. He was like, you got to learn how to make your own tools. Because I remember the tool that he had was basically like these little bamboo sticks. And I was just like... <laughs> where do you get these? And he's just laughing. And he's just like, I make these. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you make your own tools. That makes a lot of sense. And then in the show I saw with the master that a lot of his teapots were very similar. Well, I didn't see all the teapots because he only had a few uh, pots in the video. Were very similar in style. And I'm kind of curious, based on learning from him and his style, why you chose on a lot of your teapots, not all of them, to use a wood handle versus a traditional uh, well, I would say that originally, I actually, I'm gonna go get the, I'm gonna go get the teapot that he gave. Right. Another thing unique about this wood handle is it has a place for the thumb, so it can hold here and it's so comfortable. So I just thought that was kind of shocking that he picked out the Pacific wood that holds perfectly for when you pour. It's so comfortable. I was shocked. I'm like, did do this? On I purpose? I tried to. I, when I'm okay, so this is funny. Um, since we're talking about sticks, when I go out and I like try to find sticks, you would think that they're they're just like any sticks that you can pick up, but it's not. Like a lot of the sticks that I pick up that that look attractive, like after I hold them and stuff, I'm like, oh, this stick doesn't really have like a, a very good feeling to it. And so, the the shape of the sticks is something that uh, is is pretty important. And I've I've actually learned that just through trial and error. <laughs> so here's here's the teapot that he made. And it's a this is kind of a, a traditional a tokoname style teapot. And what's really interesting about it is that it's not glazed at all. It's just like raw clay that that he literally collects himself from like one of the areas by where he lives and you know I do want to say this not to kind of backtrack but this this clay adds so much like flavor to to the Japanese green teas and it's actually why it's considered one of the best clays that you can use for for sencha or even for gyokuro um, yeah. And I, I actually, I've used this a couple of times with different teas and it, it actually makes the tea worse. <laughs> so meaning like for me anyways, like I don't like the way it makes it taste uh, like a white tea. I was like, this doesn't make it taste very good. So it, it has like a mineral quality to it that goes really well with like Sencha. It, and I was just really surprised by that. Um, so going back to your question about the sticks, um, the reason why I decided to to use sticks for side handles is because well, I think they're they're more attractive, but also it's it's much more engaging, you know. For example, like you noticing all of those things, you know, about this stick. It's literally just a stick, but you're like this. This stick, you know, it's 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 incredible to hold. There's like this groove for the thumb, and and I imagine that when you first got this pot, it made you want to use it and like really play with it and 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 see how it feels, right? And so that's the reason why I like using sticks because it's much more engaging. Like it it requires a little more uh, intention. You have to hold the pots and and really uh, get a feel for 
how you want to hold it because you, there's a lot of different ways to hold these sticks. And so when you figure out how it feels, like how to hold it in a way where it's comfortable, um, and then it's much more engaging. You know, it's, it's for example, like if you had a, a clay handle pot, you won't really think much about that motion, the grabbing it, right? Like most people just grab things and they don't actually stop to think about how they're grabbing things. So using these sticks, it makes you actually stop and think like, what is the best way to grab this? <laughs> and then also like, what's, you know, what's the most, you know, comfortable way. And then when, once you've had one of my pots for a while, you can actually begin to play around with different ways to hold it. And, and I do that regularly because there's so many different ways to hold it. Um, and then the other thing too, is that it's, it incorporates another element, you know, like, if it's just like ceramics, all you all you're looking at is like clay, right? And then depending on how how you finish the teapot, there might be color there, um, or it could just be like raw texture. But the the wood incorporates another element. So what does wood make you think of, right? Like just just having a pot there with a piece of wood that you're holding is going to make you think about things like. What is it going to make you think about, Jeffrey? So that's a question for you. <laughs> what what did the what did the wood what does this piece of wood make you think about? You know, I'm sure that at some point you started to think about trees, right? Yeah, nature, because trees. That's what pick. Nature, and so that's also very intentional because I want my my work to kind of help facilitate that. I want people to to reflect on their relationship to nature you know that's that's like the bigger message right the bigger message is that it's like i want people to reflect on their relationship to nature that's so because i like a lot of wood like my table's wood i even went way out of my way to get obviously it doesn't achieve what you've <laughs> achieved but having some type of wood on my kettle like i really like wood yeah. and tea i do want to get to two more questions um and one of them was with your new kind of seeing the testament process, do you feel, I mean, obviously you need a whole different tools and studio that you might have some kind of interest in it, dabbling in or making or learning more about testament pots? Um, it's, it's definitely something that I would like to try. That's for sure. Um, I've actually, you know, I'm, I'm more attracted in, or yeah, more interested in making the the silver teapots you ever seen those i think you actually have one i feel i feel more interested in learning how to do that because i have some experience working with metal um i took some classes when i was in college uh they were jewelry classes but you're essentially learning how to construct rings necklaces you know small containers and stuff and then we learned a little bit of like metal smithing so heating metal, hammering, hammering it in order to shape, you know, in order to give it a, some type of shape. Um, so I think that it would be easier for me to learn how to make a, a silver <laughs> teapot. But, uh, you know, the thing about making a Tetsuban is that you, gosh, you, you just need, it's going to require so much practice. And then also you need certain materials because they're literally melting metal. And I don't know if you've ever tried to melt metal, Jeffrey, but you <laughs> need something that's really, really hot. They have, <laughs> they have, they don't have like a traditional forge and stuff. Uh, they had like a machine that can melt the metal um, pretty quickly. But um, so I don't know. It's, it's something that I want to uh, explore at some point. But again, I'm more interested in learning how to make these like smaller silver teapots because I feel like it would be easier for me since I have some experience working um, in that way. And in terms of like uh, your schedule, I've seen is interesting because you really, you really go at it. Like when you're going with a billion teapot, you're firing them, you're shaping the pots, you're kind of turning them down, you're getting them perfect. Sometimes you'll go to bed very, very late, I've seen. And is that kind of important with the process? Because when I visited in Hunan, black tea process, it's common for the people making black tea not to sleep for a day, two, or three, because every hour they have to test the tea. Now, obviously, teapots are different. 
Um, but how has your kind of schedule impacted so much when you're making these teapots? You know, I don't know if this is normal or not, but uh, I certainly like when I'm doing the firing and the glazing and stuff, I just like don't get any sleep. <laughs> I, and I actually, I'll, I'll start making posts and stuff on my Instagram. Like, oh, you know, I've been up all night. I'm going to take a nap. And, and there were this last firing that I did because I basically crammed like two months worth of work into 10 days. And I did that because I was trying to catch up uh, with all of the work that I had to do. Because, you know, when you move, you have to set everything up and, you know, that sets you back a couple of weeks. And so this last firing was probably the most extreme, meaning I was like up 20, more than 24 hours. And I, was, I only had like three or four hours of sleep. And I did that multiple days. <laughs> and, and it's not something that I want to do again. But um, I would say that it's, it's pretty common for me anyways, like when I'm doing the firings and stuff. To, to have long days because it just requires a lot of time. And I try to finish it quickly. You know, I don't, I don't like spending more than a day on certain things. So when I'm doing the glazing, you know, ideally I would want to finish in one day, but sometimes I have too many and it's a slow process because I'm brushing on the glazes, you know, like I literally have to like brush on the glazes it's more work if you dip the, the pot into the glaze. You can do that with cups, but not with the teapot because then you have to like clean around the, the top part where the lid sits. You have to clean the inside strainer. Like there's a lot of stuff that, that could easily get clogged if you don't apply the glaze correctly. So it's a slower awesome. process. Notice with your pots, inside glazed, but then the rim is not glazed. Then you have this unique design of glazed and non-glazed that you incorporated in the design. What are some of, yeah. why, what are some of the reasons you do that? Uh, that? That right there is just kind of more of an aesthetic. Um, it doesn't really improve the, the function, but sometimes, okay. yeah, I really like it too. Uh, Actually, my friend Steve down in Portland, he said that that design is really nice because you can like place your index finger on the raw clay of the lid when, whenever you're like, so if you're holding the, the handle like this, have you tried holding it this way? Yeah, so you can place your index finger on the raw clay and he's like, that, that feels kind of nice. Mm -hmm. like, um, but functionally, I, I don't think it really does anything. <laughs> It's just an aesthetic. Um, although there, are, I have made some pots where the button is raw clay because then it's easier to grab. Those are things that uh, I've explored, and uh, it's never ending, Jeffrey. Like there's just so so much stuff to explore. That's so cool. We'll do uh, one more question here, and then I have two questions that were kind of submitted in the chat here. Um, okay. You posted a journal entry that you made publicly that I stumbled upon, and it said it was entered in on June 22nd this year, and you said you spent the last three years mastering the basic functions of a teapot, and now you're committed to mastering other design elements only unique to you and may take up to 15 to 20 years. Could you yeah. share more about that, uh, about what that well, means and what that what, hope to achieve? Okay, so I... I've been uh, really contemplating whether I want to do this for the rest of my life or not. And <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, just think about like committing to one thing for the rest of your life. Um, it's, it's kind of intimidating, you know, because just imagine making teapots and like me imagining making teapots for another 15, 20 years. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to kind of grasp, but I was committing to to that process. And so that journal entry was my commitment. And also just a little bit of like the backstory because I have spent the last three years just working on the functional aspects. And and now I'm at a point where I feel good about it, meaning I can begin to focus more on exploring design that is going to be 
unique to me. So my signature, you know, like my style, that requires a lot of experimenting and, and also learning. Like I'm going to have to learn more stuff. So just for example, even learning how to make clay, right? Like, I don't know how long it's going to take for me to, to learn how to make clay really well. <laughs> it sounds like it might be easy, but then again, like it's probably not going to be very easy at all. And then also learning how to make my own glazes, right? Because right now I'm still using glazes that are pre-made. And so learning how to make your own glazes, that alone is going to take a couple years. And, and then... I mean, I also want to master carving, like wood carving. I don't know if you've been keeping up with my feed, but I recently made a teapot where I did some carvings in, on, on one of the wood handles. On that, yep. And match the yeah. design the bottom of the pot. I, uh, there's one thing I want to say about that, because this is kind of funny. I've been bugging this artist that lives in Oregon. He's like a master woodworker, and his carvings are amazing. I've been bugging him to like, <laughs> let me be his apprentice. Like, let me come, you know, pay you for a workshop, like something. But uh, so far, he's he hasn't accepted, <laughs> he hasn't accepted my request. So, um, but I'm gonna keep bugging him, Jeffrey, because I really want to learn from this person. <laughs> so I figure, like, I better just start practicing now, and you know, get good at it, so that maybe he'll take me serious. So that was like one of the teapots that I made recently, I'm like, well, I'm going to start carving wood. Um, and there's a lot of things that I make that I don't show to people. Let's just put it yeah. that way, Jeffrey, because believe- some of them, they don't turn out very well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's very cool. I want to, first of all, take a few questions from the audience here. Um, and one of them is actually on the design and shape aspect. Um, and he had asked, what aspects of your teapots took the longest to perfect? or become content with. Um, he said form, function, appearance, with, and, so it's a two-part question, what took the longest to perfect? And second, which aspect is most important to you when making teapots? Mm, those are good questions. So the longest, the, the, the aspect that took the longest to perfect is definitely the wood handles, like getting them to attach properly. um, That just took a lot of practice. Um, And I think that the reason why it's also the most important to me is because nobody, nobody showed me this, meaning there isn't any information on how to do that. I I just kind of have to show myself. Whereas all the other stuff, like making a lid, make, you know, how to measure a lid and how to make a spout, all this stuff you can learn very easily online. There's like tons of videos on YouTube on how to make all these things, but how to carve a wood handle and get it to fit properly. And then also, you know, using the right adhesive, like all of this stuff took a long time. So those I would say that that is definitely the the aspect of the teapot that is took me the longest, and then also uh, it's the most important to me for sure. Wow! And then another one um, is kind of connected to that. What about different shapes and sizes for teapots? Um, and he had mentioned one of a who in teapot. I'm not familiar with that type of design. Um, but other types of designs. But I do know one, like in Japan, sometimes they have those really flat teapots um, that yeah. are really open lid. Um, mm-hmm. And so maybe this question is just, are you going to explore different types of shapes yeah. like that, more extreme shapes? Well, I would say that uh, it's, it's all fun- it, it's functional, meaning like those really wide ones. The reason why those work really well for Japanese green teas is because uh, you, can, you can spread out the tea leaves and then there, well, there's less water involved, which here's the interesting thing about Japanese green teas. Um, if you agitate the leaves, it gets bitter really, really quick. I, and I'm sure you know this already. And so those flat, those flat teapots are designed that way because they're functionally the best design for Japanese green teas. And then also like the, the the shibos. Have you ever seen those? They're they're not teapots, but uh, oh, 
yeah. I guess you could, I guess you could call him a teapot. I mean, he called him a teapot. You know, Master Fugitsu would call him a type of teapot. And I was just like, really? So anyways, but um, the functional, like shapes play a, a, a very important uh, role in like the, the functional aspects because you can use specific shapes for specific teas, right? So like oolong, you know oolong, like it's it, most of them start off like tiny, tiny little pebbles. And then when they open up, you have like these really big leaves. And so for oolong, if you use like a really round shape, it functions the best. You wouldn't want to use like a squat shape for oolong because then all of the leaves won't be able to open up properly, which is important, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the shapes, I think, you know, it's something to for people to explore, you know, like just it, try out different shapes with different teas. And you might be surprised that some function better with certain teas and then also kind of make other teas uh, well, not taste so good, maybe. Like, what do you think, Jeffrey? Like, if you had oolong and the, and the tea leaves weren't able to open up properly, don't you think that's going to affect the taste of the tea? Yeah, really drastically. And I even said that even on my um, Patreon when I'm teaching people about poor, depending on the raw material of the tea, we all know tea can be grown anywhere in the world, but depending on the elevation, the farmer that produced it, and if there's more intricacies and durability and there's more nutritious in the raw material, small minute changes make drastic differences. So if you're dealing with something and you're lucky enough to drink ancient arbor or old tea trees made from poor, from old tea trees, your pot size or the amount of grams, if I chose to use 2.5 versus three grams in this small teapot will have a drastic effect, where I can get a lot of positive flavor notes from 2.5 grams, but if I move above three grams, I might cover up. The tea may be too strong and I can't notice all the subtleties of the tea. So the size, the shape, the clay, all of those things can have such a huge drastic difference in taste. Yeah. And one more bonus question here is, how did you choose the name? I'm probably going to say this wrong. Uh, Tatsumi teapot. Oh, so and what does that mean? Yeah, Susumi. Okay, that story is kind of funny. And actually, I've been wanting to maybe make a, a more detailed post about this. But I found this little stamp. All right, Jeffrey, this this like a it's literally like a little letterpress stamp. Like like that little stamp was used for letterpress at some point, and. When I was learning how to make teapots, I was going to, you know, the Evergreen Studio, as I mentioned before. And I got to a point where I finally got them to work and and people were really like interested. They're like, this is really cool what you're doing. You've just been making a bunch of teapots and some of them are looking really nice. And, and they started asking me like, well, what are you planning to do with it? You know, are you, are you planning to make a bunch of teapots and sell them? Like, why are you doing this stuff? And, and I was just telling them the same thing I told you. I was just like, you know, I just want to master the teapot. Like, I just want to learn how to make a really good teapot. And eventually, I started to think about, well, I get really good at doing this. Like, what kind of signature am I going to have? You know, like, how, how do I want to sign my teapots? Because I've always found it kind of cheesy to, like, write something on there, you know, to, like, write my name or a date or something. And so... I, I was just thinking about this and, and then I just kind of forgot about it. And I was out one day with a friend and we, and we dropped into like this, uh, this small little antique store that we have downtown. And on the counter, next to the cash register, because it's also kind of like a junk store, meaning there's a lot of cool junk there. It had this huge steel bowl. It was huge, Jeffrey. It was a huge steel bowl, like like the biggest salad bowl that you can think of. <laughs> And it was full, like, I mean, like a mountain of these letterpress stamps. And they were all like these kanji symbols. And, and I just remember like looking through them and I was thinking, this is it. I'm going to find a stamp for my work right here. And so I grabbed a couple of them and I was just kind of looking at the shapes. And the one that I ended up keeping I kept specifically because I just like the way the shape looked. Like I just really like the signature. And so I started stamping my work with that and 
And the the joke behind it was that like, oh man, maybe somebody will come across this one day and think it's worth a lot because it for some reason the, the shape just you know I that that was the way that my my brain processed this. It's like it's a really cool stamp. Maybe someday somebody will look at this and like, wow, this this must have been made by a master or something. <laughs> and so eventually. The same friend that that uh, I was with when I found this stamp, she was like, you know, you really should find out what that means because <laughs> yeah, sure. it could be stamping death on, on your pots for all you know. And so I, I ended up going like, so here's the funny thing about that stamp, Jeffrey. This, this is, you know, something that I haven't shared in a while. It's a kanji symbol. So it's not, it's not... Uh, and actually, it's an older, an older type of kanji symbol that's not used anymore. So I actually had a hard time finding out what it meant. I had literally had to go on a forum with like kanji specialists. Like the, this forum was all about kanji specialists. Like that's all they do. They study kanji. And then finally, somebody was like, oh, I found the kanji. And then he's like, it means susumi. And then so the definition to that is a dai dam or bank and and i thought whoa this is really cool like i th i thought i could use this as a metaphor because those those things a dike a dam and a bank have one thing in common they hold water right they hold water back and so i thought oh maybe i can use that as a metaphor for you know vessels that hold water and so it was kind of like this serendipitous moment. I was like, oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> but amazing. so now it's, yeah, now it's kind of become a signature. And uh, that's the story. That's the story behind it, Jeffrey. It, it sounds like there should be, you know, it, it maybe something more thought out, but it was actually just like me being a playful person. I was just like, I'm just going to stamp, start stamping my work with this. And then it led to other things. And, and, you know, so now it's become a part of me. Like, <laughs> well, maybe in the sequel, when you go back and see the master in Japan, if they take you back there, he can review your kanji choice. <laughs> yeah, the actually, they. Um, I remember when they were filming and stuff. I I told them the story, and they were like, "Oh, that's pretty nice." But they they weren't like, "Oh, like for me, <laughs> for so me, I'm, I'm always like more surprised because." I literally found a, 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 I could have chosen any other stamp that had no connection to to what I'm doing, but for some reason this stamp, you know, was connected to water, which is a big part for tea, right? Like you can't make tea without water. <laughs> and like that filters the dam. You have to see how well you can make that dam so it has the perfect amount of water going out when you brew it. Yeah, it's it was a it was a, a very interesting time i would say but well, now let's I on one thing jeffrey yes, I, I do have i do have other stamps i i went back and i got like four more <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i don't use them i just i just really like the way they look yeah. no i really like it too this is very it's, and it's even more unique that that you said that kanji is not even used that often anymore um, oh the the kanji that they use for that word has changed and uh who was it um it was one of the the, the local tea house here because he was also curious he was like what does this mean and i told him what it meant and he tried to find it and he couldn't find it and and so i had to like send him a link to this forum that had a link to to the definition and all this stuff but uh, he was able to find different kanjis maybe like more updated kanji or the kanji that they're using now for that word. So in other words, I don't have to worry about this kanji symbol being anywhere else um, other than my teapots. Like you're probably not going to come across it anywhere else. <laughs> How perfect is that? Well, on that note, what I want to kind of do is I want to let everyone know who's made it this far and still watching. Um, you can visit and see a lot of his teapots he's made on susumiteapots.com. That's T-S-U-T-S-U-M-I teapots.com. He also has an Etsy store and Instagram. Um, you can check those out. But go ahead and kind of let us know what you have on now, where people can find your pots. Do you have any kind of new upcoming pots you want to let people know? Anything you want to say, go ahead and let um, them know now. Yeah, so 
I do have some teapots available. Um, I think most of the ones that I made recently have already been purchased. Um, but I'm always making teapots. So, you know, I try to produce at least like 30 a month. And this month I'm still on track. We'll see. <laughs> um, so I'll have, I basically, I have new, new teapots available uh, towards the end of every month. And so... Wow. If yeah, if you if you miss if you miss that window because a lot of them sell the first couple of days after I post them on Instagram. So if you if you do miss that window, um, sorry, but at, know that I'll I'll have more available at the end of every month, and and I do take on commissions sometimes, but uh, it really all depends on how much work I have that month. Uh, sometimes I can't take on commissions, or any more commissions. So uh, just those are the, the only things that I want to say. Um, and yeah, check out my website. It'll, or my all those links will be in the bottom below this video. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, I'll have all the links below this video at a later date. Um, and thank you for joining this interview. Thanks for sharing it. Um, and we can follow up more. And if anyone has any questions, they want to get a link to that video, you can DM him or I, and we can send you those links as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out anytime. Bye, man. Thanks for so much. No more towel. Yeah, have a great day.